So today's lecture, uh, during this 45 minutes, I will talk about the overview of privacy research in machine learning. And I will focus on um, differential privacy. Um, I will give you some basic tutorial on differential privacy. And then I will give you an example of uh, how deep learning could be combined with differential privacy. Um, now, uh, I will end my lecture with uh, some interesting trade-offs between the privacy notion, differential privacy, and other emerging notions in ML, uh, such as fairness, interpretability, and causality. Um, I just want to make sure. All right. Um, so the first first part is about uh, overview. Okay. So. I guess there's nobody who doesn't have a computer or email address these days, right? So if you don't have in any of these, you will probably not sit here listening to this lecture. Um, nowadays, all of us can see that more and more devices collect stream our data, right? I mean, if you can afford this kind of smart appliances at home, these machines actually collect your data, right? And then stream, stream these to uh, the company server, and if you can also afford a drone like this, right, you can collect a lot of data without getting consent from the people, you know, whose images are captured. Um, now, uh, the worry is that only a few corporations own our data, and we don't know what they're doing internally, right? So it's, it's possible they might abuse them, and it is very clear that they are using them uh, for their own um, benefit. But what worries us is that we don't know, we have no control over our own data. Um, if you read uh, <laughs> articles like this, probably you're not gonna be um, uh, happy to find this like Alexa or things like this. So in this article, they said Amazon employed thousands of people to listen to your Alexa conversations. And in this article, um, there was a uh, children's smart toy called Kyla. And that was supposed to be, you know, like a good toy at home, you know, that can have a like interactive conversation with your children. But, you know, the issue is that they stream the conversation to the company server and um, anybody who has Bluetooth connection was able to hack this doll. Of course, these, these dolls are not on the market anymore, but all of these um, examples make us a little bit, you know, oh no, so can I actually buy any smart devices? Yeah, you are worried about your own privacy. So as a computer scientist, we we can definitely work on um, developing uh, privacy preserving technologies to protect people's privacy, including ours. But these technologies are also um, good. It can be really uh, useful for public good. Um, in this TED talk, Mallory Freeman talks about the importance of sharing data for public good. Um, so. The title of her talk was Your Company's Data Could Help End World Hunger, right? So it's quite grandiose and it seems very important. Um, in fact, using um, data for public good uh, has a name. This kind of movement has a name that's called data philanthropy. Uh, it was uh, proposed by United Nations Global Purse. Um, and I got the, um, I brought this quote from the director of UN Global Purse. Um, so the, the, what it says is, um, we should think about big data as a new kind of natural resource, infinitely renewable, increasingly ubiquitous. But um, unfortunately, at the moment, most of them have uh, fallen into the hands of industry, right? Um, but we should realize that data has a social opportunity and we have a social responsibility. Uh, and it is our job to make sure that data reaches the people who need it most. And I really agree with this person um, on this. Um, and that's why I'm working on also uh, privacy preserving machine learning. Um, and I hope you also feel that, okay, not only this is good for protecting our privacy, it has good intention um, you know, further along the way. So let's first look at the um, current state of um, status, current state of uh, research in uh, machine learning. So we 
typically look at several privacy settings in machine learning. Um, the simplest possible scenario is where the sensitive, privacy sensitive data is located in one location. And then um, you can run some privacy preserving algorithm and you release the model. So for instance, let's say the privacy sensitive data was uh, COVID-19 patients records, yeah? And you run this algorithm and then the output could be uh, the classifier that can uh, determine based on symptoms or whatever input features, right? whether this person has COVID-19 or not. Um, and another example is, um, well, you have the same sensitive data, but you can also run some algorithm that could give you some synthetic data. So because this is a synthetic data, you can just release it without worrying about um, any individual's privacy because there's no link to any anybody, um, right? Because this is synthetic. Um, in these scenarios, uh, people often use this notion called differential privacy. Uh, and we will talk about this thing in detail today. And of course, there are other privacy settings in machine learning where now the data uh, stays in two different places or multiple in, uh, in multiple different places. Um, and sometimes they want to communicate with each other, but maybe not necessarily giving data to each other, but some statistics computed on their uh, data might be um, you know, shared. Um, or sometimes you might have some third party who, do, who does all the computes, but you um, share your uh, certain statistics to the server to train a model together and so on. And in these scenarios, uh, there are a lot of other techniques, for instance, cryptography-based uh, uh, encryption and decryption technologies, or homomorphic encryptions and secure multi-party computation and so on. So if you are interested in learning more about this, use these words to uh, find uh, relevant papers. Um, but as I mentioned uh, earlier, I will only focus on differential privacy today. Um, Okay, so I usually ask when I give a talk, I usually ask um, how many people know about uh, differential privacy? Uh, I guess uh, I guess I cannot do that, right? So differential privacy in plain English is uh, the statistical science of trying to learn as much as possible about a group while learning very little as little as possible about any individual in it. It seems a bit conflicting, right? But let's look at this cartoon. So there is a data set one um, that includes a lot of people's information. Maybe they, the, that includes these people's medical records. Um, and you can imagine um, a data matrix, right? So where each row corresponds to uh, each person in the data, um, data set, and then each column corresponds to the features or you know the, a type of uh, record about that individual. Mm. And this D1 contains many people's records like that, as well as Alice's record. And given D1, if you run a randomized algorithm, you the output you might get looks like this. So it's randomized. So every time you run it, you get different uh, outputs. So this is in the output space. What is the um, you know output domain? And then this is the output you can get. So this output distribution. And now let's look at another data set, D2. D2 contains everybody's information exact same way as before as D1. But now I'm going to replace Alice's data, Alice's record, to Bob's record. So there is one entry difference between these two data sets. And we sometimes call this neighboring data sets. So, yeah. Uh, and then given D2, I'm going to run this randomized algorithm, the same one again. And what I hope to get is somewhat similar result uh, as before. Why? Because um, if an adversary who has an access to these outputs, right? By looking at these two outputs, this adversary cannot distinguish whether Alice was in the data set or Bob was in the data set. 
assuming that this adversary knows everybody else's record. Uh, more formally in differential privacy, we look at this particular quantity called privacy loss. Privacy loss is log probability ratio, where the first probability is the probability of the algorithm A given data set D1, outputting a particular output O. And the second probability is the probability of A, the algorithm, given data set D2. So remember the data set D1 and D2 have a one entry difference and they are neighboring. Uh, that algorithm outputting the exact same output O. Um, so what this says is, well, this privacy loss, this quantity tells you how well we can distinguish two different data sets. Imagine um, in some cases you have a large difference in these two probabilities, right? Then from adversary's point of view, well, it's clear that something changed, right? And um, it's easier to guess that uh, somebody's uh, data changed from this to that, right? Whether, um, on the other hand, if these two probabilities are very, very similar to each other, um, that that uh, that kind of um, distinction will be harder. So formerly, differential privacy in differential privacy, um, when this um, absolute value of the privacy loss, so it's this whole thing, is bounded by epsilon, where this bound holds for all possible outputs O as well as all pairs of neighboring data sets. Then we say this algorithm is epsilon differentially private. Okay. So in practice, how do we even apply this, this notion, right? Um, well, the easiest way is you can add randomness to the output of your algorithm. So then the question is, oh, like randomness, what kind of randomness is it? You know, like that there are multiple mechanisms I will talk about later, but whatever mechanism we are talking about, in the end, the noise variance has to be uh, proportional to uh, this quantity, something called uh, sensitivity, and the other quantity that we saw before, the upper bound to the privacy loss, right? So um, what happened is, if your algorithm is sensitive in this sense, so sensitivity is defined in this way, if um, the maximum difference between the outputs of these two uh, outputs of the algorithms given these two neighboring data sets, yeah, when there is only one entry difference. Um, so if your algorithm happens to be very sensitive to this kind of change, then to conceal that difference, right, you want to add more noise. So in a way, it makes sense. Um, and another quantity here is inverse, pro inversely proportional to the uh, privacy lo loss. Um, so the way you think about this is, uh, if you allow for large privacy loss, yeah, that means you don't need to add so much noise in an extreme case, right? If you just uh, let everybody know about your data, you don't need to add any noise, right? Then epsilon goes to infinity. Yeah, then the additive noise scale becomes zero, right? On the other hand, if you want, if you don't want to allow any privacy loss, you want it's not to be very, 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 very small, let's say 10 to negative six, then the noise variance uh, you have to consider should be really large. So it also makes sense, right? This kind of relationship. But the problem is because we are adding some additional noise and that depends on privacy loss, inversely, and also uh, sensitivity, um, you have a um, un this inevitable trade-off between privacy and accuracy. So I made this uh, cartoon. Um, you are cranking up the privacy loss. If you allow for larger and larger privacy loss, your accuracy of some algorithm will reach the uh, non-private um, algorithm's um, accuracy, right? But um, in practice, what we want to do as a um, machine learning researcher, um, we want to develop a um, machine learning algorithm that, privacy, that, pri that preserves privacy, uh, that gives you a relatively good accuracy as well as a relatively uh, reasonable level of privacy. 
And I mean, here, a reasonable level is kind of an open question and it depends on the application. What epsilon uh, is uh, reasonable? Um, there, there are a lot of studies on this thing, uh, but let's just uh, keep it this way and then we move on. Um, and here I will talk about two different differentially private mechanisms that are really widely used. So the first one is called Laplace mechanism. Well, as the name suggests, we are adding noise drawn from a Laplace distribution. Um, let's think about this easy example, very simple example. Uh, suppose my data set contains um, monthly salary of n different individuals, right? So xi x1 means uh, first person's um, monthly salary, yeah, and etc. And then um, I don't know which country this is, but in this country, yeah, the unit, um, this salary uh, is always between zero and 300. So nobody gets uh, more than 300. Um, and the output I want to uh, produce is the average salary of these people, right? So this is the formula for average. And I'm not sure if I want to uh, just release this thing. So I'm going to make this um, as differentially private by adding the plus noise. Do you remember the noise scale has to be proportional to sensitivity divided by privacy laws, right? So this is exactly what, what we saw before. S is the uh, sensitivity defined this way, in this way. Um, okay, so in this example, Computing sensitivity is relatively easy, right? Um, but we can go back to that, I think, uh, for the sake of, um, for the interest of time. Um, I will not talk about this in detail, but when when these, um, each data point, it has this limited um, uh, uh, input domain, then it's typically easy to compute the sensitivity. It's even um, analytic, analytically tractable in this simple example. Uh, so you can find the uh, noise noise scale easily, but in in some cases there is unbounded sensitivity, and there are also worked on uh, to handle this kind of situation. Um, some of you might think, uh, okay, I guess this is how it is, but I actually want to prove prove that by adding this much noise, it is actually epsilon dp average. Well, so I prepared some uh, derivation. So we look at the definition of differential privacy, right? There, we talked about privacy loss. It was log of this one, but let's just think about exponentiated this probability uh, ratio. And because we added Laplace noise, right? The output of this mechanism follows Laplace distribution where the mean is now shifted, right? So shifted mean and the scale is the same but we are evalu evaluating this thing at a uh, particular output O, right? And if you use the um, inverse triangle inequality, uh, revert, is it inverse? No, not reverse inverse. Um, the, 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 the opposite of the user um, triangle inequality, um, I don't remember the name, but the, you can get this upper bound, right? And then, well, we saw this thing as is nothing but the sensitivity definition. So you can easily bound this thing by epsilon. Remember this, this should hold for all possible value of all and all possible um, neighboring data set uh, X and X uh, prime, yeah? And so Laplace mechanism give you this epsilon differentially private um, output. Um, another widely used mechanism is called Gaussian mechanism. So here you add noise from, drawn from Gaussian distribution, right? Um, here, but there's slight difference um, from the plus mechanism. Here, the noise variant, noise scale is again, uh, something similar to the previous one, right? So you have the sensitivity of your function you're computing divided by the privacy laws, but there's some constant here. C of delta. So what does it mean? Okay, I think we will go back to this thing. Um, all right, so what this constant says is basically, you know what, because um, in this uh, Gaussian case, you are adding noise, but um, this privacy loss is not always bounded by epsilon. 
Sometimes it can be larger than epsilon, but don't worry, that probability will be bounded by delta. It cannot be larger than delta, right? So this delta can be viewed as a failure probability. This gives you this notion of approximate differential privacy. So this, by adding this Gaussian noise, the release value is epsilon delta differentially private. So that means this pure differential privacy definition um, holds with probability at least one minus delta. So there is a difference between Laplace and Gaussian mechanism. And one gives you the guarantee of pure DP. The other one gives you the approximate DP guarantee. Pure DP is nothing but epsilon DP. It's just a word that people use. And um, for the sake of time, um, for the interest of time, I was actually, OK, wait a second. Quick clarification. Shouldn't noise be directly proportional to privacy loss as well? Mm. Remember, this privacy loss is actually allowed, private, allowed what you are allowing, um, what you are allowing. So if you are allowing large uh, privacy loss, uh, that means you don't need to add so much noise. So that's the, that's the logic, um, why this has to be inverse, inversely proportional to the noise scale. Um, OK, so we talked about two different um, mechanisms, but there are a lot more mechanisms. You can definitely look at this, um, um, this book. This book is actually pretty well written. Um, of course, this was written in 2014, so this, there are not, like a lot of new works are not included, but it gives you, re the, the I mean, as the name suggests, the, the true foundations for differential privacy. Um, so if you're interested in this uh, topic, read at least for three chapters of this book, then you will feel, uh, okay, now I have some background and then I can start looking into more uh, recent work. Okay, um, and then uh, two important properties of differential privacy before we move into the more applications of DP to uh, deep learning. Um, the first property is called post-processing invariance. So what it means is differential privacy is immune to post-processing. So we, we, we saw this thing uh, a lot today, right? So suppose there is a sensitive data set, private sensitive data set, and then you run an epsilon DP algorithm. For instance, you add Gaussian noise to some, some value you computed on this data, data. And you have another algorithm that takes the output of this epsilon DP algorithm. And the output of this algorithm is epsilon DP with respect to the sensitive data. Okay, this is called post-processing invariance. So in a way, if you release this, um, the, 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 the privatized salary, right? Salary, average salary, people can use this thing to do other things without worrying about the privacy of those people who are in the original data set. And another property, important property is called composability. Um, this means um, if you access the sensitive data twice, say once by using this epsilon one DP algorithm, the other time using epsilon two DP algorithm, the union of these two outputs is epsilon one plus epsilon two DP, right? So your privacy loss increases the more you access the data. And in fact, this upper bound is pessimistic. And there are better upper bounds uh, when you compose these uh, uh, DP mechanisms. Um, so if you're interested, you can look at this paper. Um, so we talked about post-processing invariance and also composition um, property of DP. But this composition property is what uh, makes the, uh, you know, applying DP to ML algorithms very challenging because a lot of ML algorithms are iterative meaning it access data over and over and over, right? Like the, the, the most um, obvious example will be stochastic gradient descent when you do deep learning training, right? So yeah, so there is a, a high challenge in that, how to privatize deep learning training. Okay, so now we move to deep generative modeling with differential privacy. Um, in this example, we will go to uh, the task of generating synthetic data. 
in a privacy preserving manner, right? Um, so the goal is uh, I want to transform this privacy sensitive data to non-sensitive ones, so synthetic data. But at the same time, I want to keep these two data sets, statistical properties the same or similar in some sense. Uh, I will look at the q and &A. Okay, this is not a quick thing to answer, so I will continue. Um, so classical approaches for data generation with differential privacy typically assume a particular query class. If it's a linear query, that means, for instance, it could be the sum of data points. That's what they are. They want to release and, and so on, right? And um, they uh, had a lot of papers were um, theory-based paper, and they had a like formal guarantee on the usefulness of the synthetic data um, for that particular query class that are assumed. Um, um, but the problem is if you want to use this uh, synthetic data, right, uh, for other tasks, uh, then outside of this uh, particular query classes that were assumed initially, then there is no formal guarantee anymore, and then definitely it lacks flexibility. So deep learning people came into this differential privacy field and they thought, well, this is an easy problem to solve. Let's just use GANs because GANs can produce anything you want, right? I mean, this is true, but um, it is hard to find a good privacy and accuracy trade-off uh, if you use GAN. I can tell you why. Um, and there are several works done uh, that try to uh, you know, combine differential privacy for GAN training, before going to that, I will just give you a very uh, brief recap of what GAN is. I, I believe all of you read, uh, heard about it many, many times this week. Um, so GAN has a generator, right? Generator takes some random input from a known distribution, say Gaussian. And then it generator transforms Z to data sample. Yeah, X tilde is generated data. And then discriminator, looks at this generated data and the real data and tells you whether uh, they are similar or not, or fake or not, you know? Um, and I'm, I brought the, the most basic laws that GAN paper used initially. Um, and there's a min max um, optimization, right, here. Um, I mean, for us, uh, for, you know, privacy people, what's important is in your loss function, who is actually looking at the data? Who has access to data? Uh, who has to access the data? Well, only discriminator sees the real data, right? In this case, but generator never sees the data. Um, so people thought, okay, then let's perturb the gradients of the discriminator for privacy. And because of the post-processing invariance of DP, the trained generator is also DP with respect to the training data. And this particular way of uh, privatizing the GAN, this is called a DPSGD. This can be also used for any other models. Basically what it does is add certain amount of noise to a stochastic gradient descent step, right? But the problem is you do this gradient perturbation in every learning step, and you are not gonna train again within an within an epoch, right? So you have to train this over and over for many, many uh, epochs. And this results in high privacy loss. And as we saw before, due to the composability of DP, um, also um, GANs are usually like a big architecture, right? They usually have a big architecture and the parameters, number of parameters for discriminator is uh, pretty much large. and that means it has also larger sensitivity. Um, so yeah, in the end, combine these two, like compatibility and the large architecture, just simply applying DPSGD uh, to GANs doesn't work. And some people realize that, hey, I mean, but you're using GANs and try to just like, uh, you know, produce uh, amnes disease or fashion amnes uh, images and so on. 
Um, and they cannot really go to uh, more complex data like CIFAR-10 or ImageNet because epsilon, you know, the required epsilon is so high, there's no like practical sense of privacy uh, protection there. So they are somehow bound to these very simplistic data sets and try to use GANs for that. And then it doesn't make so much sense. And then if you try to use GANs, you have to add noise to the gradient in every training step. So it's not going well with DP. So a lot of people realize that, you know what? Um, why don't you just uh, use a fixed discriminator? In other words, why don't you use a fixed features, fixed set of features that are that you don't learn from the data um, uh, to judge the similarity between real and synthetic data? Because if you use a fixed set of features that are not learned from data, there's no privacy loss in it, right? So the only where, only place you have to pay privacy budget to is for training the discriminator. And uh, here are some examples. So this DP Murph and DP Synchron, these two papers use this idea that we are gonna use the fixed set of uh, features uh, that are not learned from the data. On the other hand, this DPC GAN is one type of GAN uh, that basically produces images condition on, so C means condition on the labels. Um, here, to ensure the privacy uh, guarantee, they use DPSGD. So every in every training step, you add noise to the gradients of the discriminator. Uh, and these are the images produced for Epsilon 10. Yeah, all of them. Um, and well, by eyes, you can see, okay, I guess it's bottom two are better than the first one. Uh, and another way of more uh, quantitatively um, evaluate the usefulness of this synthetic data is um, you can train a uh, classifier using this synthetic data, generated data in each case, right? And then test the trained, let's say, logistic regression uh, classifier on the real data test real test data. So that means you want to see how uh, well uh, generalize your synthetic data to real data in this sense, right? And these are the numbers. So if you use this fixed uh, set of um, uh, features to generate these uh, images, you get about like 75.5% test accuracy. Um, on the other hand, if you use this uh, DPC again, you get like 50% test accuracy, which is significantly lower than the other two, right? Um, but then the problem is, while you are actually comparing these two in this very simplistic uh, data sets, um, so here it makes sense that you're using some fixed set of features, uh, works well, but if your data is more complex, then this idea doesn't work. In fact, there's a new work, um, uh, which is available in the archive, this is actually our work, um, that tries to uh, um, generate CIFAR-10 images, right? This is a real data samples. Um, and if you use this uh, fixed feature, uh, fe features, it, and these are the samples you can see. Um, these are quite terrible, right? Nothing close to these uh, images, but, um, so this paper basically suggests that why don't we use some public data to pre-train a feature extractor network, and then we compare two data distributions uh, in terms of those features. Um, and if you do that, you can actually get um, images like this for a reasonable at a reasonable privacy budget. Um, and FID score already tells you this is a lot better than the other, right? So definitely there is a more work to be done uh, to improve um, this aspect, to try to find a good uh, balance between privacy and accuracy uh, in the context of um, like high dimensional data generation, image generation. I will quickly check Q&A if there's any quick question I could answer. Mm. Okay, I will move on. Uh, and then um, the last 10 minutes or so, I will talk about the um, differential privacy without other, you know, how differential privacy interacts with other emerging notions in ML. So there are three different notions I will talk about, um, fairness, interpretability, and causality. Um, 
you might wonder when you see this thing, if you don't know anything about fairness or interpretability or causality, you might wonder how is even privacy interact with them? I mean, what do you mean by interact? And what do you mean by trade-off? Like how, right? It's going to be a little bit bizarre. So I will give you a concrete example. There are, I, I must say, um, in these uh, intersections, there are a lot of work done recently because these are all new um, new concepts, right? The interpretability of like black box models and so on, or fairness. Um, yeah, these are very new uh, um, ideas and uh, very new research uh, topics. Uh, what I'm giving you is a tip of ice iceberg, big iceberg. So you just uh, listen to what, what I'm talking about today, but please go to those um, suggested readings uh, I, I put in, in my slide and to get more, you know, to learn more about these things. Um, they are quite exciting um, and very different from what was studied before. So the first example, I will look into this paper, uh, fair decision making using privacy protected data to uh, talk about fairness and privacy trade-off. Um, so the task they considered was um, uh, educational funds allocation using US census data. Um, so I didn't know about this, but apparently uh, US Census Bureau uh, releases um, census data that includes a lot of population statistics and the government agents, other government agencies uses, use this population statistics to determine uh, how much money they will use for whatever, you know, like uh, welfare uh, for US citizens. So one example, uh, this paper actually talked about several examples, but I will only focus on one example task. Um, uh, so that's basically educational fund allocation that takes um, uh, these population statistics released by US Census Bureau. And uh, the goal is to make decisions on how to distribute funds to offer educational assistance to disadvantaged children. So there is a huge responsibility, right? In using this statistic correctly. And if you just use a statistic, uh, Rose's statistic, uh, there is a privacy uh, concern. So people started using um, differential private uh, mechanisms in US Census Bureau. But in this paper, they talked about two different mechanisms. One is just like a very simple Laplace mechanism to add noise to the uh, statistics, right? Or they also talked about more advanced one, but uh, we will not talk about this thing uh, in this talk. And this finding is quite interesting. So the noise added to achieve privacy disproportionately impacts some groups over others. And if your privacy constraint uh, is more stringent, then this phenomenon gets more pronounced. Okay. So this is a table they showed. Uh, let's look at this thing. Um, they considered. Um, it's basically they are comparing the true allocation, fund allocation. If you don't add any noise to the statistics and then you follow some formula that US government uses, right? For um, educational fund allocation and you have the true allocation based on that. And if you add noise uh, at epsilon 0.1 level, that means you add a lot of noise versus if you add noise a lot less, right? Because epsilon is 10. Uh, and they saw what happens uh, uh, on the uh, what happens in this um, uh, allocation um, fund allocation in terms of uh, in small districts and large districts. Small large means in terms of the population who are eligible for this benefit. Um, what they found was small districts receive inflated allocation of funds. So this times means actually. Uh, more than 10 times more than um, non-private allocation fund, yeah, allocation. And then this is 1.01. So that means uh, your um, when your privacy budget is high, right? When you allow for larger privacy loss, then the difference between non-private allocation and private allocation is not so high. But if your privacy constraint is really strong, then you have a 10 times more um, uh, fund allocated for this small district. On the other hand, the large district actually had a different problem. They actually got the lower amount of um, uh, funds. 
So what happened is, why is this even related to fairness? It's because uh, in the end, they got this money, right? For a small district and larger district. Um, and they allocate this thing to each student, right? But then that means per student benefit for larger district is significantly lower than a, the per student benefit in the small district. So this is unfair uh, for each student, right? Um, so that's what they found. And actually other similar findings were also observed here. Differential privacy has disparate impact on model accuracy. So here they talked about model inaccuracy increases uh, for uh, underrepresented groups uh, once you add the differential privacy uh, mechanisms in your training uh, of your like deep classifier. And there are other further uh, readings on privacy uh, fairness accuracy, uh, sorry, trade-off. And there's also very nice tutorial on fairness. So I didn't actually talk about fairness, uh, algorithmic fairness notions at all here, uh, but there are a lot to learn uh, on the, just for fairness itself. Um, and then I will also briefly talk about interpretability privacy trade-off um, by looking at this particular paper. Uh, so people started looking into interpretability because a lot of people were saying, okay, the black box models are really useful. Uh, they have a really high uh, accuracy in classification, right? Um, but they don't know why uh, the classifier says you will die or you, you will get a heart attack within like, you know, within like 30 days uh, based on your medical records so far and so on, right? So you want to actually understand why this black box model makes such a decision. And there is a one um, very well-known and widely used interpretability method called LIME. It's the, it stands for Local Interpretability Model Agnostic Explanations. Um, this is how it works. Uh, it uses a relatively simple surrogate model, for instance, a sparse linear model that can give you a very um, um, uh, Briefs, uh, it, it can give you a, a local summary of like explanation about a complex black box model. Um, so let's look at an example. So they train a uh, inception network. Um, and then I actually, I think they just downloaded it, downloaded inception network from Google. Uh, and then they are uh, interested in why or whether if this uh, network says this is a dog, or a guitar, right? It can be anything. And it wants to know why that classifier makes that such a decision. To do that, uh, they wrote down this kind of loss function where G is, for instance, G can be anything actually, but uh, in this particular example, they use this sparse linear model. So they uh, considered surrogate model as a linear model. So W is the parameter and Z is some, Z prime is some input. And then F is the complex black box model. So you want the output of these two models to be similar, right? Because you are minimizing this thing with some weight, pi. Here Z and Z prime are the non-zero elements of X. X is this uh, test image uh, drawn uniformly at random. So if you increase the non-zero elements uh, in Z that it uh, recovers X. So you, it, it conceptually what it means is there is a test point I want to understand. And then I basically have some uh, uh, sample around this, around this test point. Uh, and then this weight is, could be something like, um, you know, if this, L, this D is a L2 distance, this could be viewed as a uh, like exponential kernel, right? Uh, squared exponential kernel. Anyways, what it says is, if my candidate Z is similar to my test point X, then I will give a higher weight than uh, the other case. So by minimizing this thing, what they found was when the label was a guitar, actually this W, you know, you are minimizing this thing for W. And actually there is another constraint that uh, enforces sparsity in W. Um, the recovered W is basically this area, pointing at this area. So that means, okay, this black box model says this is guitar because this is focusing on here, right? On the other hand, when the label was a dog, you can see the, 
in this case, using this label, right? And minimizing this thing gives you this particular W that points at um, the face of the dog. So it's a very nice way of like getting an uh, interpretation at around the test point you are interested in. So that's why they are using this word, the local explanation. Um, local meaning that at that particular um, test point. So this paper, Model Explanations with Differential Privacy, uses some something similar to this Lyme objective we just uh, look into. Um, for privacy, they added noise to the gradients during training. Um, I mean, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but uh, overall, it's gradient perturbation. Um, and the evaluation metric is in the following. So the objective function, given the non-private explanation, uh, they compute this thing, and also they computed expected objective function given privatized explanations. And they look at these gaps, right? Uh, and then they say, if the gap is large, that means you are, your explanation, privatized explanation is farther away from uh, non-private explanation. This is a metric they used, and they look at three different data sets, and they evaluate this metric at two different epsilon value, epsilon one and epsilon point one. Epsilon, sorry, epsilon point one and epsilon point one. And as you increase the privacy constraint here, right? This uh, distance, this gap gets larger uh, than when epsilon was point one. Another thing, so if this is point of interest, so basically if your test point is like this, oh, sorry, if your test point is like this, and if you, uh, have very small epsilon, allowed very small epsilon, then your explanation has almost no meaning. There's no visual cue, right? You cannot understand what this is. But as you increase epsilon, you allow for larger and larger privacy loss, then the uh, explanation becomes more visually recognizable. Yeah, okay. Of course, there are similar findings. Um, I guess people are all thinking very similarly. Um, so here is the another paper you can look into um, and further reading on interpretability and privacy trade-off here, right? Um, and there's a very nice uh, interpretability tutorial on interpretability methods. Um, this was in ICML 2017. Okay, now um, I wanted to talk about also causality privacy trade-off, but uh, uh, for the interest of time, I will only give you the reading suggestions. So please take a look. And I will wrap up my uh, lecture uh, by um, summarizing what was discussed today. The first one, we talked about differential privacy. Um, people love this. Uh, people even say this is like a gold standard privacy notion because of this probable guarantee, right? And then we all, always have to make sure that the particular algorithm you develop has to uh, satisfy this upper bound, the privacy laws upper bound epsilon. Uh, we talked about two different properties um, and two different example mechanisms. We also talked about um, differentially private um, generative deep generative modeling. Um, also, we talked about the trade-offs between differential privacy and other uh, notions in uh, machine learning. Okay, so thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mijun, uh, for the great talk. Um, we have a couple of questions in the Q&A chat. Uh, the first one is from Samuel. Um, the question is, are there contrastive sorry, learning process to differential privacy uh, that is enforcing the same output for any one person substitution in, the, in some population drawn from the data set? I uh, could use the population and one sub population as the positive pair and using different populations to create negative pairs. This is a very good uh, <laughs> so I don't I don't think I've ever seen uh, um, such a formulation. Um, I think the problem is though, mm, this is talking about like given a data set, right? You are re removing one person and then have a like positive example and then negative example and you know in this contrastive learning sense. But then the problem is this privacy loss has to satisfy. Let me go back. It's a bit hard to 
do you see this? Um, right. So this privacy loss has to be satisfied for all possible observable and also pairs of data sets. So it's actually, let's say you remove one person from the data, right? But somebody can always give you another data point that can uh, make the, uh, change the upper bound. So um, in a way, this is not actually, um, but of course there is also like a, a paper on um, differential privacy using this uh, local data, your own data, and then just changing one person from the data. But this is actually not um, consistent with the original um, definition of differential privacy because it has to satisfy uh, for all possible pairs of neighboring data sets. Um, I hope this is clear. Thanks for the answer. Um, Samuel has another question. If this is synthesized data lacks diversity, could it be biased against certain subgroups of the population? Is there a trade-off between data privacy and data fairness? Yeah, this is a very good question. Um, so people usually talk about the fairness privacy uh, trade-off in the context of classification. Um, but yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't know off the top of my head, uh, what the correct answer is, but this is definitely something you know interesting to look into. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, the next question is from Lena. If we use a fixed set of features not learned from data, where do we train on the data? And can you give an example of fixed data, uh, fixed set of features? Yeah, this is actually a very good question. So, I mean, for the interest of time, I actually didn't talk about this thing. Uh, do you see my screen still, right? Yes. Um, so the DP Murph paper, for instance, they use this uh, random free features. Um, it's basically you, you can embed your data in this... Um, uh, something like just imagine this as like some uh, random projection. Yeah, so you embed this to some some random projection, but if you have like a lot of uh, dimensions, you know, uh, which uh, where you uh, project your data onto, then um, you can kind of cover uh, different frequencies if you analyze this thing in, um, in, uh, in uh, Fourier domain, right? So you don't learn this uh, random projection from the data, you just uh, you know consider like sufficiently large number of um, projections, uh, but this simple thing can still like you know generate this kind of MNIST fashion MNIST data uh, a better way than training uh, GANs with DPSGD. Okay, thanks. Um... The next question is from, is from Nicola. Um, in the context of releasing privacy protected data using generative, generative models, do you see other possible solutions besides differential privacy? Mm. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. Actually, I don't know. So, um, if you want to actually share data, right, then there are ways to do that. You can use uh, um, cryptography-based um, uh, techno techniques like encryption, decryption, and then you actually agree on certain uh, protocols and then you share data. Um, but if you want to generate using deep learning, um, yeah. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, thanks. Um, our next question is: uh, We can can we say that the sharpness uh, of their optimizers are differential differential um, privacy friendly? Oh, I don't know what sharpness of your optimizer is. Um, not also not very sure. Um. I will Google it today and then I will answer it tomorrow during the faculty mixer. Yeah, sorry about that. 
Okay, uh, now we have, uh, I guess, time for last question uh, from Eric. What do you think about using partial observability as a privacy preservation method? Um, partial observability. Hmm. Yeah, we'll also think about this thing. Uh, it's, a, it's not so easy to uh, answer. By the way, can we actually look at the last one? Oh, yeah. It depends on the accuracy of the model. Since the addition of privacy has an impact on accuracy, could we be facing an accuracy privacy interpreted? Yes, definitely, definitely. Because you're adding noise, right? I mean, there is actually a triangle. Um, so you the traditionally you only talked about like accuracy and privacy trade-off. And uh if you add interpretability in it, right? You by adding noise, your interpretability suffers as well as accuracy. Um, and if you ask, like, is there any any other uh, way to find the balance between all three? I believe so. And um, the other paper, one of this paper that you know similar findings, that paper is uh, trying to find that balance. Um, so maybe you want to look into that. I guess we'll wrap it up. Thank you again, um, Jim, for the great talk. Um, we're happy to have you here.